getting those kids to understand that investment point um, as they get older is important. On the flip side of that, parents have to understand that they are just kids and not every kid is a dirt bag. Like not every kid wants to come home from school, do their homework and go out in the yard for 30 minutes and bounce a ball off the ball or hit a ball off the tee or whatever the case is. Welcome to the Foul Pole to Foul Pole podcast, brought to you by Black Diamond Softball and Fitness, presented by the Till Valhalla Project, where heroes live on forever. People all the time, hey, can I, you know, pay you to tell me how you do your social media? I'm like, listen, I I record what I want to record and I post it. Like, and I'm that's not what one makes of it guys. organic. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm not one of these dudes that's sitting at home holding on to 20 files and then making it a production and then blasting it out there. It's like when it comes through my brain and through my phone, it's going up. Uh, that's what I do on the audio side of, of my podcast and what I do. I, I do have people on like you and, and others. And I talk about the game and I talk about the mental aspect. I'll talk about recruiting and stuff. And then when I'm laying there in bed at night or I'm in the office first thing in the morning, I'll just have like these thoughts or whatever. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to hit record. I'm going to put it out there on, on iTunes and the podcast and stuff like that. And I'll get a kickback from somebody and say, Hey dude, I heard your little five minute podcast, but I don't even know if you can consider a podcast. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. You know, it just, it just pops into my head and people like it and like you're doing the same thing. It's like, you're just putting your, like what you do with your athletes. And when you're training them, you're just, you're taking that and saying, Hey, here's this drill that I've been working on or whatever here here it's yours take it do it yeah take that's, it that's that following that you have and dude i know you've been busy um i've been keeping up with you on socials and stuff tell us a little bit about kind of like what's been going on man so um i personally because of the way of the world right now and the internet especially with hitting um i've taken kind of my next kind of not i mean i'm gonna say pet project but not really pet is to try to start bringing people together. Mm-hmm. You know, there's so much diversity. And again, decisiveness and everything else, that's, you know, everybody's going to have their own opinions. But how everybody is so dead set in one way or the other, and you got to get on this wagon, and you got to get on this wagon, and you got to do this, you got to do this. And I don't remember if on our first uh, conversation or not, we discussed it. I'm mm-hmm. a firm believer that the, the true facts and the true methods is kind of somewhere in the middle. Yeah. of the extremes yeah. and so they they have like a whole conference they just did a camp on it, it was called bridging the gap yeah. and it was kind of, um kind of the old school versus new school if that's really how you want to talk about it um but that's kind of where i've gone dude so um yeah i've uh, run a bunch of small clinics in towns and while i'm there i'm going and seeing professionals like true been in been around major leagues professionals mm-hmm. um and asked to get access to their, not only their facility, but to, to them and discuss hitting. Um, and so I was just out in Dallas and got to meet up with Mike Brumley, who's been around the majors for 40 years now, player and coach, um, sat down with him for like an hour and a half. It just flew by, um, literally sitting on a bucket in a cage talking hitting. Um, and yeah. And the way that he, describes things is simple but yet it it's in depth enough that it will apply to the big league guys and I was able to come back and use some of it with my younger kids he was talking about bat path and how to stay through the zone and using examples that you know we we know that to be true yeah. but it was just another way of talking about it and then I was out just got back from Vegas uh, with Joey Kuna at the farm lab. Um, and, you know, everybody knows him as the scissor kick or the kickback guy. Well, I'm okay. here to tell you, I was there for almost four hours and never heard him say either one of those words. Yeah. Um, it's all understanding how the body truly works. He's very, he's a biomechanic person, um, highly technical, a lot of technology and, mm-hmm. You know, I was under the impression, dude, that could get kind of mind boggling. Well, when you sit down with the guys that understand it and they simplify it and they can point out, you know, this is where we need to look. And so you're not kind of just pasting stuff together. You have the data right there. And it's like, this is where we need to look. Um, 
been out to California a while back, uh, was with David Ring out in San Diego. Um, he works with a bunch of major leaguers and minor leaguers. Um, how he goes about it, kind of the way that he has his program set up. Um, I'm about to go up to Philly and to that area and get with some coaches up there. Um, so yeah, man, just traveling the nation, uh, doing camps when I, or doing camps, traveling to see the coaches that know more than I do, been around longer than I have, um, or have a different clientele. Um, Mm. so yeah, it's been great. Went to the, uh, Texas High School Baseball Coaches Association, went and listened to some speakers there, um, just kind of getting that feel. That's kind of back to my roots. You know, I started as a high school baseball coach. Um, so going there and seeing the energy of those guys, learning new things, seeing new products, uh, meeting people from the industry. Um, so, yeah, man, it's uh, it's been good. It's um, I'm blessed. I, I really am. I, I'm blessed to be able to do what I love and the opportunities now that I have. So, yeah. You know, we, you and I, we connected last year and uh, we just kind of struck up this, this friendship. And and I told you before we actually, you know, got going, it's like, I, I said, you know, I don't know if it's that I'm, I'm, I'm proud of you or I'm just, I, I'm, I'm proud of the the friendship that me and you have because we come from way different backgrounds. Um, and the, just the relationship that me and you will pick up, we'll text, we'll say something, we'll do something or whatever. And um, just being able to watch you interact with the the young ones that you interact with and then you're able to go out and get the information and then take it back to those kids uh, that you work with daily and you got high school students whether it's softball or baseball that are able to use you as almost like conduit from the ones that have made it the ones that have the information you're learning it so you can teach it and continue to grow the game I know analytics and numbers and metrics are a big part of the game but you and I both are from that old school mentality of if I can't understand those numbers, I can't teach it and be able to help these, the parents and the athletes understand that. So as we're starting to develop that into having a good relationship between what I see and what I feel and what the numbers say, how big of a part is that becoming in youth sports as far as measuring and and being able to kind of, say, hey, this is what you saw, this is what you felt, this is what the numbers are showing, so this is where we're at, this is what we can change, and this is where we're we're good at. Well, I I don't have a lot of technology in my facility. Um, If parents come in and they have personal blast or they have personal diamond kinetics or whatnot, uh, we just don't have the resources for that currently. Um, So all of mine is based on, I do exit speed off a tee, Mm -hmm. Um, We have the ability to do exit speed off a thrown ball. Um, But most of mine is sound and sight um, and and finding barrels. Now, for the kids that do have access to the numbers, one of the things that I stress a whole lot is don't go chasing numbers. The the, The information is good if it is used properly. But if we're just out there swinging to try to develop a higher exit speed, you're probably not going to get those results that you want nearly as quickly because you're not paying attention to how the body's moving effectively, efficiently, mm-hmm. um, those types of things. So I, in my personal opinion, the fundamental base needs to come before we start putting numbers to it. Yeah. Now, if you're talking about high school, you know, varsity level guys and girls that hopefully if they're playing varsity, they're mechanically sound. They have a good foundation. They have a solid approach. They understand how to make adjustments. They understand what their body's feeling. Okay. Now, if you want all of this, we can break it down. Some players don't want that. And then some players want every freaking decimal point you can give them, (laughs) you you know, and you have to kind of with those type players, you really have to find that balancing act. Be like, look, man, I know that these are the numbers that are optimal. This is where you are. Let's develop a plan to get there, but simply, like I said, chasing certain numbers, I think loses sight of what hitting really is, which is very fluid, very adjustable and ever changing. Um, So it's, it's, it's a balancing act. It really is. And there's, and there's so much information, you know, it's, and, you know, kind of segue into what we're going to talk about with parents and pressure and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I think parents get caught up in the numbers 
more so, especially like if you're talking like under 13, dude, those numbers are for the parents. Those kids, a very small majority, they ain't going to care. It's not like they're walking into their, you know, fifth grade classroom going, hey, man, my uh, hand to ball speed is, you know, 1.5 seconds and my exit speed and my launch angle are blah, blah, blah. Like that's not happening. Yeah. You know, but dad walking into his business office is a oh, dude, my fifth grader just did this, 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 this. Yeah. So wh- what are we really doing it for? Are we doing it for parents to talk about? Or are we doing it for the kid to truly get better at the young ages? Yeah. And, and that's, that started with, with cleats that started with gloves that started with <laughs> bats. It's like, Hey, I just got Tommy, this brand new Louisville slugger. Well then now, it starts to catch on. I got to keep up with the Joneses. I'm the fear of missing out. And now yeah. it's the so-and-so's got this exit velocity. This so-and-so's got this pitch speed. I mean, you see in, in the softball world, you'll see girls holding up the pocket radar. I hit 63. And again, there's no context to it. You don't know if she yeah. ran up and did it or, or whatever. <laughs> that's for mom and daddy. And, and that's, it's, it's unfortunate. And I was, I was going to say that it's the parents see it. There, there's metrics and, and the analytics side that they see in the MLB that's starting to trickle over into softball more and more. And so parents want to keep up with it and they want to see how far away Johnny is from MLB numbers or Johnny is from D one or D two numbers and see, okay, where can I get them to go? And they never look at the, the bigger picture of stuff. It's man, we got to have a, a solid core of foundation. And, and that's, that's what it, it boils down to. And you're around, you talk to parents all the time. I mean, we're getting some stuff, right. And, and I wanted to ask oh, you for, as parents, what are we doing right uh, that you see? And, and uh, we'll get into what we're doing wrong. Yeah, man. And, and that's the thing. I do another podcast. Uh, well, actually a couple at this point. And, I told, I told the guys, I was like, man, we need to back off the parents a little bit. Like parents are getting a bad rap when it comes mm-hmm. and we don't talk about the good, right? Mm-hmm. And parents these days have the ability and are giving their kids access to so much information. And I don't mean so much in a bad way. I mean, yeah. in a good way, like you can reach out, you can really find somebody that you connect to, you can give your kid the best opportunity to succeed. Um, yeah. So with what they are able to provide and what they're willing to provide and the access to coaches and information, um, parents are doing a really good job. I don't have the numbers, so this may not be factual. <laughs> I would assume that there are more high level players now than there have been in the past yeah. players that compete high. Yeah. Okay, between the travel, uh, so, you know, high school and travel and everything. Yeah. Um, and that is due to the parents being able to provide their kids trainers, yeah. pitching trainers, hitting trainers, agility trainers, strength and conditioning, all of that. So uh, parents, parents are doing a really good job with that. I think for the most part, you know, the, the negativity is highlighted too much yeah. and the positivity is not enough for every parent that, you know, coaches may complain about on a team. You're talking about a team full of 13 and there may be two parents that are a problem that right. are going about things the wrong way, but they're the ones that get talked about. It's mm-hmm. not the other 11 that are sitting back there being supportive, not saying a word to the coach, trusting the process, doing all those things. And those parents need to be praised more, yeah. right? They're, think they're about, making. Think about the investment that the, and the sacrifice that those parents are putting in. Yeah. Um, the time, the money, um, every, everything that goes into it. And that's one of when when players become old enough to understand that that's a conversation that I have. I was like, D- we need to understand the investment that your parents are putting into this so that maybe you can better understand where some frustration comes. Yeah. You know, if mom and dad have been paying four hundred dollars a month for the past two years for four hitting lessons a month and you're only practicing once a day and we're not getting better, that's on you. They're putting an investment in and you're not doing your side of that equation. You're not doing your work. Yeah. Um, and that comes to the accountability thing. Um, you know, the best parents in the world are the ones that know that they don't know and are willing to learn. Yeah. The, the ones that generally are a problem are the ones that played 
either into high school, maybe some college, um, maybe have some resentment. Their their careers, playing career was cut short. They had a coach that did them wrong, right. whatever. And so they're trying to shield their player from any any of that that they might have gone through, um, whether it was lack of physical ability or whether it was just, you know, you drew the wrong straw this time or whatever. Yeah. Um, so – uh, getting those kids to understand that investment point um, as they get older is important. On the flip side of that, parents have to understand that they are just kids and not every kid is a dirt bag. Like not every kid wants to come home from school, do their homework and go out in the yard for 30 minutes and bounce a ball off a wall or hit a ball off a tee or whatever the case is. Um, and that's the other thing is you can pay as much as you want to pay. You can take your kids to whatever trainers you want to take them to and provide them everything. But I, it's that you can lead a horse to water, yeah. but you can't always make them drink. And so that conversation needs to be had in a not I'm paying for this. You have to do this, but mm -hmm. rather a I am willing to provide you with the resources you need. Yep. Do you love this? Do you want to work at it? And kids will tell you for the most, unless you have some parent that's just, rah, 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 you know, kids will say, no, nah, man, I, I don't really want to do that. Or yes, I really, really do. Please. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I think, like I, I said, par parents get, parents get a bad rap, man, but there, there is far more better parents than there is overbearing and negative parents. Absolutely. I, I work with, uh, with a lot of young ones around here and I have a great set of, of parents that um, they're in it for the right reasons. They understand the pressures that kind of go with everything. And we have the conversations that, you know, it's their journey and, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be better than some, you're not going to be as good as some, but eventually when everything kind of levels out and, 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 you know, push comes to shove, hopefully there is an opportunity for, for them to continue playing if they want to, there's a lot of opportunity out there um, for our parents to, to mess up. And that's just how society is. But for the most part, the, the parents that I have talked to, they're doing it for the right reasons. And of course there are some, some bad apples in, in the mix, but like you, man, it's kudos to the parents that are willing to sacrifice their sanity to allow little Susie and little Johnny to continue the dream that they have right now as a 10 year old or as a 12 year old, but that could change down the road. It's just like someone that, that was taking their kids to dance classes or piano lessons or whatever. Me and you just happen to be lucky enough that we're in the business that we're in and we get to teach them and, and, and kind of mold them right now. But in five years, who knows, man, they may, may never pick up a ball again. We don't know that. Yeah. But we've got to do the best we can. I think that's what parents are doing, too. Uh, I, and again, I, I do. I think that the, the positives highly outweigh the negatives. But just like mm -hmm. in anything else, the negatives get highlighted. Yeah. Um, it, it's easier to talk bad about things than it is yeah. to look for the good and do all that. Um, so I. I try my best to really, really encourage and let parents know, hey, man, your kid's doing great, but it's because you're allowing them to do this the right way. You're, you're not force feeding it. You're not putting and you're not making it a negative event. You're not giving expectations that exceed um, ability, age, whatever that may be. Um, and I think that's where the negativity comes in mm -hmm. is the parents that set unrealistic expectations um, either for age or for physical ability or for desire. Yeah. You know, you can have the best freaking athlete in the world, but if they don't love the game, it, it's just not going to matter how much money you throw at it. You know, exactly. you're right. You're right. You know, and I consider myself lucky and I know you do too, to, to be able to have this opportunity to work with athletes. The parents are giving you the opportunity to work with their athletes and, and trusting that you're trusting them. To, you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing and, and I'm glad to be a part of it. Um, the, the negative side of it is though, the pressure that comes with it. And there's going to be pressure because eventually the kids get old enough and they start to understand that there's a lot of money involved. There's a lot of time involved. There's a lot that kind of comes with that and, and parents and, and the kids are, they're human. So they, they have, they feel a certain way. 
And it, like you had mentioned earlier, just that that dialogue, having that conversation. So the parents and the kids are on the same page to a certain level, um, I, I think helps out. But there, there's so many that that rush the process. And I think for oh, me, man. that's the that's the biggest part of the negativity. For sure. And um, I talk about I speak on this all the time uh, when when asked either, you know, in this in this format, like on a podcast or something or whether it's just in the facility, somebody gives me a phone call, you know, we're not going to put everything back in the box and restart. But if we could, in my opinion, travel, select competitive softball, baseball wouldn't start until 12. Yeah. Um, I, I think that 12 years old is kind of, and just, and this comes from 20 years of coaching and elementary, my background, all of that, just mentally that 12 years old is when kids, you really start to see that, okay, I'm going to dive into this or I'm not. Right. And the fact that there are seven, eight, nine, 10 year olds that are playing select baseball and traveling, you know, three, three weekends a month, four weekends a month playing all these games and it's that do or die every single time you go out you know I had a god man I have a 14 U. this happened yesterday I have a 14 U kid who is an absolute stud athlete but this kid didn't pick didn't pick up a baseball bat until 12 years old and just decided I want to play baseball and he comes and he steps in my cage about this been, I guess about a year and a half ago. Um, He was an old 12 turned 14. He's not even 14 yet. He's about to, he's 13. And last fall um, hit like seven bombs in, in 14 new baseball and, and hadn't played, you know? And I told him, I was like, dude, you're different. I was like, we need to get you into a wood bat right now. Like you're strong enough. You need to get into a wood bat and you need to go. He comes back. yesterday. He's like, coach, my coach got mad at me for swinging a wood. I was like, what do you mean? He got mad at you. I was like, I was like, when? And he goes on Saturday. I was like, timeout <laughs> Saturday in a pool game. Your coach got mad at you for swinging a wood bat and you're getting ready to be in high school next year. Yeah. Okay. Um, why? And he said, I don't know. He just told me I couldn't swing wood. And it's like, dude, if we are doing that to kids and you don't understand the development level and how much better you can get by swinging a wood bat yeah. at that age than a metal bat, that's a huge problem. And I can't dude, I can't imagine a seven year old showing up at, 8 a.m. on a Saturday and having coaches so dead set on winning those games and putting that mental pressure on those young kids. And then you know how it goes, man. You're going to have those coaches out there, those parents that, you know, little Johnny goes 0 for 4 on Saturday. And so the parents freak it out. Oh, you're going to get moved down in the lineup. You got to do better. You know, the coach is going, well, I got to win. So I'm going to move you down to nine hole because you were 0 for 4. So Mm -hmm. now you just shattered any (laughs) chance of confidence that they may have. um, And you're getting internal pressure from the kid because now it's not about the game. Now it's about I just let down mom and dad. I just let down my coach. You know, it's not about them. They don't understand yet. You know, now, example, you get that Bengals guy that hit Mahomes out of bounds, 22 years old, and that dude's like crying. That's different. Yeah. That's what you're doing to your seven-year-old. It's just not on a national scale, but emotionally and mentally, it's the exact same thing. And and that's where we have to be better as instructors, um, as coaches, and then, of course, as parents. The game has to be fun, number one. And if you are constantly worried about my failures going to lead to – there's no way to have fun. You need to understand failure, right? This game, you're going to fail a lot um, in the batter's box, but that doesn't define you. It doesn't mean you suck. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't play. It just means that this game is hard 
and you've got to work at it. Yeah. Um, and bridging that gap is huge, man. Like you got to love it. You got to work hard. You're going to fail, but we're not going to sit here and hammer you and lower your self-esteem and, you know, take away the fun because you went 0 for 4 on Saturday in a 7U baseball game. Right. Yeah, and I, failure is my favorite word because I use it quite a bit. And there's so many different definitions, so many different ways we can use that failure. You know, they, for me, I try to tell my athletes that failure is what connects the athletic side to the character side of our development. So we can develop athletically and lift weights and run and, and do everything we can do. But it's hard for us to get them to develop mentally unless we start to go through stuff. So we need that failure piece to kind of connect those to bridge that gap between the athletic and the mental side of it. And coaches, man, that they, they like to see highlights and stuff like that, like all of us do, but they also want to see character when it comes to recruiting. When we're talking about, you know, years down the road yeah. now for some of these athletes, but man, they, they want to see how you are as a teammate. They want to see how you are as a, as, as a human being, like when you get out of the car, uh, you know, go show up to a tournament, how are you treating your parents? How are you talking to your parents? You know, people around you, your coaches, yes, ma'ams and, and, and no sirs and stuff like that. So that character side of, and that's where parents kind of need step in and how you're raising your kid, because that's going to get them recruited just as much as their athletic ability, because when they get to a certain point, everybody can hit bombs everybody mm -hmm. you know, they're all in the same pool they're you know we're splitting hairs between athletes and you got the unicorns out there but when it comes time to to pick that school and go to that university hey those coaches nowadays they are talking to parents just as much as they talk to the kids because they have these helicopter parents the other day i was talking to mandy balda and she brought it up now we have lawnmower parents where these parents will go out there and mow everything down and take everything away that that could potentially hurt or potentially you know, upset or negatively affect my kid and they push everything out of the way. So these kids can't develop mentally. And you as a coach, you're in there, you're dealing with them, you're talking to them, you're developing athletically. How do you go about helping them to develop mentally as well? The, uh, that's a loaded question because there's <laughs> a lot that have, well, there's just a lot of mental. There's like, you have your mental toughness and then you have like your mental approach, like your actual mm -hmm. plate approach. Right, right, um, right. One of the things that I heard, and man, I wish I do such a bad job of seeing stuff and then not writing it down. And so I don't remember exactly where it came from. But about three weeks ago, I was filing through Instagram and there was a coach talking about flipping the script. Mm -hmm. And what he meant by that was we under, and it was this as it pertains to hitting, you mm -hmm. could do it for anything, but as it pertains to hitting, he's like, you understand you're going to fail. And so when you fail, we have to flip the script on our own brain. Yeah. We, we can't sit, we can't sit there in failure. We have to instantly basically flip that to a positive. Um, so but I hit a rollover ground ball to the shortstop. Okay. Well, yeah, that's a negative and every kid's going, Oh, I've messed up, blah, blah, blah. Well, the positive on that is I can stay inside of this next pitch. Okay. Now, now I'm thinking in a progressive way. I'm not living in the past. I'm not worried about what just happened. I have failure, but now I learn from that. And this next one, I need to do the opposite. And so I've started talking a lot about trying to flip the script mm -hmm. um, on ourselves to try to stay in a more positive mindset. I also, when I'm talking to, to kids about their mental preparation is don't, Think about the numbers. Right. That's the thing is mentally, you can't go into this thinking about producing numbers. You have to take it down to the basics. What is my job in the batter's box? Competitive at bats, fine barrels. Yep. That's it. Then everything else will fall as it may. Right. Um, and so that when you can do now, it's hard. You know, because everybody in the back, well, I'm 0 for 4. Now my batting average is 225. Like, that's how they're thinking. Instead of thinking, see a good pitch, you know, put a good swing on it and let the chips fall where they may. Yeah. Um, and the other part of that is just the preparation side. Um, kids don't prepare correctly. 
they may get out in the in the cage or whatnot or on the mound or whatever they're doing and work hard, but it's not proper. It's just getting what I would call empty reps. They're right. not going through their mental process. They're not going through their pre-pitch routine, uh, whether that's pitching or hitting or infield or whatever it is. And so once they get into the games, they don't have the ability to get into that mind space because it hasn't been practiced. Right. They've just been going through the motions. Um, and so mentally, we talk ab about all of those things, you know, being able to translate your practice mentality to games you got to be able to get focused, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to be able to flip the script on your own brain. When something negative happens, how can I be better next time? Like right now, mm -hmm. how can I be better at this? Um, so, and then of course, the mental approach, you know, being relaxed, knowing your zone, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, th those are basically the three areas mentally that I, de that I deal with most, um, with my lessons and my groups. Yeah. You know, as hitting instructors and, and you are way up there uh, compared to, compared to myself, but we, we still have the same approach and, and I can sense this sometimes in, in my lessons um, from parents, not the kids, and maybe a little bit with the kids. Uh, I want to get rid of this, the mentality of you have to be perfect when you go into a session with your hitting instructor. And I want you to speak on that just a little bit, because I think it'll set the tone uh, for, for parents if they hear it from you instead of just hearing it fr from somebody like me. Yeah. Talk a, a little bit about the having proper expectations when you're going into a lesson, whether it was with me or, or with you. That's such a good point uh, question. Um, and you are spot on like, <laughs> kids come in and they feel and maybe yeah feel think whatever that the lesson is a test the lesson is not the test the lesson is just that it's a lesson you're going there to learn something new hopefully hopefully we're not spinning our wheels because you're not practicing hopefully every time you come in that cage whether it's twice a week whether it's once a week whether it's twice a month whatever your setup is, you are going in to learn something new to get better at it. And every single adult on this planet understands that when you're learning something new, you're not going to get it right the first time, the second time, the third, however many times it may be. Mm -hmm. I always go back to school, always with the young ones. Hey, when you were in kindergarten, were you multiplying? No. <laughs> were you even adding? No. Did you even know your alphabet? <laughs> no. Okay. That's what we're doing here. Yeah. I'm, we're learning the alphabet. And then we're going to learn to put small words together. And then we're going to learn to read two words at a time. And then we're going to learn to count to 10. And then we're going to learn to count to 100. And then we're going to learn to add and so on and so forth. So the expectation has to be appropriate to that kid if i've got an eight-year-old coming in you should have no expectations let me do let me do my thing let your kid do their thing and i will walk you through this mm -hmm. if you've got a kid that's been with me for you know two years um then the expectation is they're going to be better at what we discussed last session or two sessions ago but it's not going to be mastered yeah. there's nobody that's ever done this that is perfect if there was, there'd be thousand batting averages. Right. I've I've always got to explain that. Three hundred, get you paid. Three hundred, <laughs> get you into the Hall of Fame. And that's failing seven out of ten times. And I know it's been said over and over and over, but that has to sink in. Like that yeah. thought. Like people have to understand that. Um, with the parents that have those expectations that that are just unattainable, basically. Those are the ones that I tell you, you need to go sit in the car <laughs> like it be, because your kid is looking over at you every swing or looking to find you. And so they're not focused on what we're trying to do. Yep. Um, the strive for perfection in a batting cage. If you want to talk about it that way, yes, I'm trying to be as good as I can possibly be, but not being perfect and then thinking that there's something wrong with that. That's an issue. Right. Um, 
we're always grinding. I had a kid yesterday, um, came in, came in from out of town, never seen me before in person. Dad found me online, set it up. And I would say, okay, swing. And he legitimately would like stop. And I'm like, hold on swing. Like he's like full. I'm like, yes, like a full. Swing. And he still would like, and I'm like, okay, man, what, what are we not understanding right now? Like, we're not going to be able to do this. And I can't see what I need to see if you don't. And he goes, well, I don't want to mess up the technique. <laughs> at, at, that, at, at that moment, it's like, okay, back that truck up. We've, we've got to go. And I had the whole conversation. I'm expecting you to mess up. Like, mm -hmm. I'm expecting this to be hard. I'm expecting it to be kind of discombobulated. That's why we are here. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think that that is just kind of the environment. They go in and they want to show the instructor what they can do and that mm -hmm. they're good instead of understanding I'm a clean slate. Yeah. And this dude is here to help me you know, and it's going to be hard coming in. So I think that that's a huge, huge problem and that that needs to be conveyed to parents and players alike, that you go to a lesson to learn something, learning new things is hard. You're not going to be perfect. Yeah. I could not agree more, man. Before we get out of here, I want to thank you again for joining me, but you know, it's as far as, you know, working with youth athletes and stuff like that, man, I, there's just no one out there that has that same approach you do. And I, I want to thank you not just for myself, but from the parents and all the people that you come in contact with via social media and places um, that you don't think people see you, man, we do. We're paying attention to you. And I cannot thank you enough for what you do, man. And, and again, joining me on the podcast, spreading the good word, man. I wish you nothing but the best. And I, I can't wait to catch up again soon. Dude, it, and the feeling is mutual, you know, good people in good places. And like you said at the very beginning, uh, the way that we hit it off, the way we communicate just here and there, um, the positivity, uh, this is what it's all about. And the fact that you have me on and we can get this out to the masses yeah. and everything else. And I am always open uh, for anybody else that listens to this. If y'all want to get a hold of me, you know, Tyler will tell you. Yeah. Um, I'm accessible. I'm not one of those that's going to sit <laughs> back and, and try to hide anything from anybody. Yeah. Yeah. So. And we'll make sure that uh, all of your social are linked below. Your YouTube channel okay. will be linked below in the description as well. I'm going to try to get as many people as I can filtered over to that way that maybe they don't know how to get a hold of you until they found me or, or whatever and just get more to, to follow you because you're doing it the right way. And uh, man, again, thank you so much. Very, man, you're very welcome, and I appreciate it, Bubba. You have a good one. You too. All right, so that's going to do it for this episode. Big shout out to Josh for joining me. Josh, man, you're doing so great with Hitting Done Right. If you haven't checked out his channel yet, check it out over here on YouTube. It's Hitting Done Right HDR. You can find him on Facebook. You can find him on TikTok. He's always posting drills that's going to help you out or help someone you know. This type of stuff is what youth athletes need. I mean, all this information at their fingertips. They can grab their phone. If they want to go through a workout or say, hey, you know, I want to do some hitting. I don't want to do the same stuff I'm normally doing. Let me look up Josh. Let me look up hitting done right. Find a couple of drills that may work for them. They work it out. Boom, they're done. You know, Josh, he's traveling the country. He's doing big time things. He's working with a lot of these, these youth hitting instructors. He's working with MLB guys. He's working with softball gals. He's doing a lot of big time stuff. So make sure you head over to his channel, hit that subscribe button on his. If you haven't hit the subscribe button here on mine, please do so. It helps me put out content just like this. Make sure you smash that like button. And if you like this type of stuff, man, share it with a friend. And when you do, you tell them you love them.